Heritage Explains listeners, now more than ever, we need to remember why we are proud to be Americans. This Independence Day, make your pride for America go viral. We're asking all our listeners, friends, and family to post on social media a short message as to what makes you a proud American. Don't forget to add the hashtag #ProudAmerican to each post so a larger audience will see. Share the goodness of America and make sure all know why we are proud. For more ideas on how to engage in our Proud American campaign, visit www.heritage.org. Slash proud American. That's www.heritage.org slash proud American. From the Heritage Foundation, I'm Tim Desher, and this is Heritage Explains. I am a proud American. What an incredible declaration! If we sit back and think for a few brief moments, there's no doubt in my mind that reason after reason will flood your thoughts as to what makes you a proud American. I mean, look at all we have to be thankful for. For me, the word "all" is the difference maker. I'm a proud American because of all that I can do, and the opportunities all our freedoms allow. It'd be nearly impossible. To count the many blessings that have come from being a citizen of this great country, the freedoms, the ability to dream, and the optimism in ourselves and our fellow citizens. Ever since its founding, this nation changed the framework for what all people are capable of. With liberty, we can achieve anything. So this week, in light of the Fourth of July holiday. We're going to focus on the document that continues to inspire us to enjoy all the blessings we've experienced as Americans: the Declaration of Independence. What we celebrate on the Fourth of July is the discovery that behind all the accidents of race, nationality, ethnicity, language, however you want to define it. Behind all the politics of blood and soil that made such a catastrophe of the previous century, there is a bedrock of human identity which is the same in every human being, and within that bedrock of human identity, as endowed by its creator, are these rights. Dr. Alan Gelzo is an acclaimed scholar of American history at Princeton University. He's also a visiting fellow in the Simon Center for American Studies here at the Heritage Foundation. This week, he walks us through the miracle of the Declaration of Independence, giving important context and explaining how it's important to continue to look to it as a national guidepost. Dr. Galzo, the drafting of the Declaration of Independence is a remarkable story. And what the Declaration has produced is even more remarkable. Can you set the stage for us in terms of the build-up and getting to the point of actually declaring independence? Well, understand what the American Revolution was about and where it was about in 1775 and 1776, because that was when the first hostilities between the army of the British Empire. And the commissioned forces of the Continental Army under George Washington、uh, were having their first collisions. What was this all in motion towards? That was the real question, and that question came down to two possibilities: the colonies either would or would not declare themselves independent of Great Britain. There was not much enthusiasm for anything which settled for a negotiated settlement. All the old conflicts, which had brought American matters to this pass, would only crop up again, and both the King George the Third and his Prime Minister Lord Frederick North and Parliament showed little taste for anything short of complete American submission. That left a move to declare independence, the only alternative. But 
that alternative involved huge risks. Britain had emerged from the Seven Years' War, which ended in 1763, as the greatest imperial power in the Atlantic world. To oppose Britain, the colonies had next to nothing in the way of a navy, and only the sketchiest of armies of militia and continental regulars. So unsure were many Americans that when a general continental Congress met in Philadelphia in 1774, some colonial legislatures actually forbade their delegations from discussing independence. But as the conflict wore on through 1775 and 1776, resistance to the idea of independence crumbled. Pushed on by some early successes by the Continental Army, by independence-minded delegates like the Massachusetts cousins, John and Samuel Adams, and by the propaganda skills of Tom Paine in his sensational pamphlet, Common Sense, mocking the whole notion of kingly government and calling not only for American independence, but for the establishment of a republic without any trace of the old British monarchy. Okay, so public sentiment starts to change, and there becomes an understanding among Americans that things are just not going to change and almost get worse. So what was the tipping point? Well, it was deeper and wider, too, because in May of 1776, a second Continental Congress resolved to authorize the formation of new governments in the colonies that would favor independence. In the meanwhile, an attempted invasion of Canada had failed, and news had arrived that the king was hiring German mercenaries to beef up his forces. Both of those developments signaled to the Congress they needed allies from abroad, and the only way they were going to get such allies was to declare independence. So finally, on June 7, 1776, the Second Continental Congress, and they were meeting in Philadelphia's State House, is what we now call Independence Hall, uh, adopted a resolution offered by Richard Henry Lee of Virginia that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states absolved from all allegiance to the British crown. And that was adopted without a dissenting vote by the Congress on July 2nd. Now, at the same time, Congress authorizes a committee of three, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson, to compose a declaration to frame Lee's resolution, which, in good lawyerly form, would itemize the reasons why the independence of the 13 British North American colonies and the organization as the United States of America was justified. Now, I've seen the declaration be referred to as mere propaganda, which is obviously not true. But talk about the document itself and the writers, because I I, I think this helps demonstrate the seriousness and what was actually intended. Well, start with the people who were supposed to write the declaration. Um, Franklin and Adams were part of this committee, but they really didn't have much of a role to play in it because they were already occupied with plans for alliances and foreign policy. And in fact, both of them would end up going as emissaries uh, to Europe, uh, recruiting European support. The task of composing the declaration was left largely to Jefferson, uh, largely because he had already demonstrated more than a little talent in writing with his uh, 1774 tract, A Summary View of the Rights of America. But, you know, this was not going to be the usual legal declaration. A declaration is a kind of document a lawyer composes when filing a motion in court for a judge to give a summary judgment. Uh, now, like a declaration, it itemized 27 separate grievances the Congress believed justified the separation of the colonies from the British Empire. Yeah, and, and just to stop you there, it's funny because uh, 
when you know I'm, I went through law school and and did that whole thing, and when I read a complaint, that's not a very inspiring document to read. No, and, <laughs> and, 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 and frankly, you read these 27 grievances in the Declaration of Independence, and they are a real eye glazer. Right, and and it's funny because you know this document has served as such a guidepost throughout American history. I mean, you've done extensive work on Lincoln. You know, I found it li- interesting that Lincoln began the Gettysburg Address citing not the Constitution, but the Declaration of Independence. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King used it as well, and, and many others have. So, I mean, this has really shown to be a guidepost. So, I, you know, get into a little bit more of why that is, this court document. The reason why this apparently very legalistic, grievance-laden court document, lawyerly declaration catches fire, it's not because of the 27 grievances. It's because of the opening sentences of the declaration. Because in those opening sentences, Jefferson did something that declarations generally don't do. He laid out an alternative theory of government to every monarchy which had ever existed. He founded government on an entirely new basis in modern times, borrowed in large parts from the philosophy of the 18th century Enlightenment. So, you know, let's take those words at the beginning of the Declaration, words that have been worn smooth with familiarity. And he starts off with a simple sentence of what he's about to do. He tells people he's going to explain to the world what American independence means. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Now, that's pretty straightforward, and he could have gone right from there into that list of 27 grievances without missing a beat, except he's already slipped in a sign of where he's going next by asserting that American independence is based on the laws of nature and of nature's God. That's important because it's not on British common law. It's not on parliamentary statute. It's not on Magna Carta. It's not on Justinian. It's not on any ancient lawgivers. And above all, it's not based on mere political power. You see, for time out of mind, human societies have been built as hierarchies, as pyramids, if you will, with kings at the top and nobles in the middle, and commoners on the bottom. And that hierarchy was part and parcel of common law and parliamentary statute and all the others. Jefferson proposes to sweep that aside. The American experiment in independence, like Galileo's and Newton's experiments in physics, is going to be based on natural law, not traditional authority. And and that natural law leads to my one of my favorite phrases sentences in all of the things that I've read in my entire life which talks about what they call inalienable rights life liberty and the pursuit of happiness just just put that in context <laughs> because well that's the real revelation because having given away in that first sentence that he's basing the American independence on something very different than traditional societies. He then comes in the next sentence with the real revelation that this law of nature contains five components, truths, which Jefferson describes as self-evident, self-evident like the axioms with which you begin a geometrical proof. Self-evident because they're open, they're understood, they're assented to by the human mind as soon as they're presented to it without any need for reasoning one's way to them. So here they are laid out in one long, majestic sentence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, 
and the last of these five, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to effect their safety and happiness. By the time we get to the end of this sentence, every system of hierarchy in the known world has crumbled. All men are created equal. There are no kings, nobles, and commoners. There's no one class born, as Jefferson would say, 50 years later, with boots and spurs ready to ride on other people's backs. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, rights, not status. People don't come into this world with status branded as high or low or common or royal. People arrive simply in this world with rights. And whatever status they earn afterwards is purely the result of how they use those rights. Now, what be these rights? Well, Jefferson doesn't create an exhaustive list. Remember, this is a legal declaration, not a philosophy textbook. But he wants us to understand that the list of these rights at least includes three things, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And having these rights, this is self-evident. Everybody knows they have them. No one cannot not know that they have them. And since people come endowed by their creator with these rights, the purpose of government is not to create these rights or to bestow these rights or to withhold them as punishments. It is to secure these rights, Jefferson says, that governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And you have to add, for no other purpose. When a government takes into its head to claim otherwise, then the time has arrived for what Jefferson goes on to say is the logical result. For the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. In other words, governments do not make people from the top down. People make governments from the bottom up, and they can unmake them too. I, I want to really dig into what it meant to be a signer of this document. You know, we say we want life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. You know, we can get into what all those what what those mean, but they also say they pledge their lives, their yes. fortunes, and their sacred honor in order to get this, in order to give this to all people um, that would consider themselves Americans, and you know, to people around the world who want to embrace freedom as well. So, is that is that something that? You know, we're being sacrificial. We're, you know, it was that was that the mindset of the time for the people that signed this document? Well, they're being sacrificial, certainly in the sense that they realize they're putting their necks in a noose. Yeah. They are rebels against the authority of the king of Great Britain. And had there been threats um, by the crown? Um, say, if you were to do this, you're you're going to die kind of thing? Oh, yes. the, crown, the crown declared this a matter of treason. This was a treasonous rebellion. And the British army was there in North America to enforce that. And had the members of the Continental Congress been captured, let's say, by a surprise operation, let's suppose that the British army had the 18th century version of the SEALs, and suddenly, uh, one evening in 1776, they descended on Philadelphia and bagged the entire Continental Congress, then, yes, uh, they would have been fully as much liable to the penalties of treason as earlier rebels against royal authority had been. I'm thinking of Monmouth's Rebellion in the 1680s. Uh, I'm thinking of what was done to the regicides when Charles II is restored as King of Great Britain in 1660. Oh, yes. I mean, that was the fate that they certainly had to contemplate. And yet, and yet they take this risk. And they believe that it's worth taking the risk because they're establishing American independence on something more than just their personal advancement or their personal ambition. They are establishing American independence 
on the laws of nature and nature's God, and the self-evident possession by all men of certain inalienable rights, which included life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When they did that, the members of the Continental Congress had done more than merely dissociate themselves politically from Great Britain. They, they actually did more, in fact, than just create a republic rather than another monarchy. What they had done was to justify the idea of a republic on the basis of natural law and natural right in harmony with the political theory of the 18th century enlightenment. They had reached across the normal boundaries of what the 18th century or the 17th century considered to be political rebellion and treason. They'd reached across that to lay hands on a principle much, much more sublime. They believed that they had touched the bedrock, the reality, the natural law of human society and human relations. And for that, they were willing to risk their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Or in a more practical sense, as Benjamin Franklin said to them, they were going to have to hang together or be assured they would all hang separately. Yeah, I, 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 I keep trying to bring this into modern context. And w w where my head goes, Dr. Galzo, and, and you, can, you can pick up on this um, where you'd like, is... You know, there's a lot of people out there right now saying that they are currently demonstrating or they are currently pushing for what was called for in the Declaration of Independence because of equality. You know, the word equality, equality, equality. We're pushing for equality, equality, equality. And yet it seems like there's a lot of inequality effervescing through what they're pushing for, which is equality. So, you know, put that a little bit in context as well with, you know, statutes being torn down and with speech being um, silenced. Um, w you know, where are we off today? Abraham Lincoln once said that the pursuit of equality was a little bit something similar to what you find in the Gospels, where followers of Jesus are told, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And Lincoln explained this, and he said it's not because he ex there was an expectation that they were going to immediately manifest moral perfection. No, Lincoln said this was an aspiration. It was there to be aspired to. It was there to be worked towards. It was there to be explored, to, to be refined, to be tested. And that is what we have been doing through much of our history. Many of the people who want to tear down statues do so because they're, they're violently disappointed that George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or Ulysses Grant or, truth be told, even Abraham Lincoln did not somehow produce perfect equality out of their back pockets. They would have been the first to admit that no, they didn't, because nobody knew at that point what equality really might involve. They knew and had some basic idea. It certainly did not involve a hierarchy. It certainly did not involve nobles and kings and a social pyramid. That much at the time of the Declaration of Independence, they were able to sweep away, which was a major step toward equality. But then there have to be other explorations of this term equality. And Lincoln believed we are continuing to experiment here. And the word experiment is not a bad one to use in this context because Washington uses it, Lincoln uses it. We are an experiment in equality. We are going to find aspects of equality that we are going to explore for years hence. And sometimes we'll experiment with them and find that they lead us to dead ends. There are some pursuits of equality, such as we have seen in the French Revolution or in the Bolshevik Revolution which held out the promise of a still greater equality. But we have put by the mistakes of the French Revolution. We have put by the mistakes of the Bolshevik Revolution. There's no reason why we should try to repeat them simply because of the enchantment of the word equality that they misused. We should return in our pursuit of equality to the guidance that is offered us by natural law, by natural right, by those inalienable rights that 
Jefferson describes life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and they are the bulwark of the proposition that Lincoln believed the Republic was founded upon when he spoke at Gettysburg. If we will take that as our guidance, if the pursuit of that natural law and natural right is what leads us to understand equality and interpret equality, then we really will have equality in its true and right sense, not in an equality that drips with blood and which produces more harm and more suffering than the equality which Jefferson and Washington and Lincoln promoted, risked their lives for, and in Lincoln's case, gave his life for. Dr. Gelzer, this is fantastic uh, context for why we celebrate this weekend. And and to our listeners and to everybody else in the, in the Heritage family and the Heritage Network, we're asking people to post on social media with a hashtag. It's hashtag Proud American. And I'm curious, with the declaration in context, why does it make you a proud American? For this reason, it's sometimes said that it takes 1,200 years to make a Frenchman. I mean, there's a culture there. There's a history there. There's a language there. There's a religion there. And they'll let you know it, too. (sighs) They will indeed. (laughs) But you can become an American in 20 minutes. And the reason why is that America is not built around a race, a religion, an ethnicity, a language. America is built around a proposition. It's built around what was written into the Declaration of Independence. And whoever wants to step up and say yes to that, at that moment, by appropriating that proposition, they have become an American. Great thing that we celebrate on the 4th of July is not just an American revolution against British authority. It is not just a piece of parchment with elaborate and beautiful handwriting signed so boldly by John Hancock. What we celebrate on the 4th of July is the discovery that behind all the accidents of race, nationality, ethnicity, language, however you want to define it, behind all the politics of blood and soil that made such a catastrophe of the previous century, there is a bedrock of human identity which is the same in every human being. And within that bedrock of human identity, as endowed by its creator, are these rights. And the American experiment, the American Republic, is about creating a government which puts those rights in first place and gives them the freest possible field for operation. That is what we celebrate Dr. Gelzo, it is such an honor to finally speak with you. We've been trying to get you on the show for a long time, and so it is a great pleasure to speak with you. And for such an incredible topic as this, thank you for your time and um, have a great 4th of July. And you too, and all Americans. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Heritage Explains. Take some time this week. Read the Declaration of Independence. It is certainly time well spent, and I'll go ahead and link to it in the show notes. Also, don't forget to post what makes you a proud American. Remember to use the hashtag ProudAmerican when sharing on social media. We can't wait to read them. Michelle's up next week, and we'll see you then. Heritage Explains is brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. It is produced by Michelle Cordero and Tim Desher, with editing by John Pop.